there is part of our culture that we've grown up with that men shouldn't be asking for help, that men shouldn't show emotions, that it wasn't tough to do so, that it wasn't being a man to do these things. That's not the entire culture that we have, but it's certainly part of it. But is that healthy? Is that healthy for a man? Is that healthy for society? This is something we explore with Jason Priest in this podcast. Welcome to Share.Care, an all-inclusive community sharing experience, strength, and hope to create strong, healthy, and inspiring relationships. Share.Care communities work toward every individual feeling safe, valued, and heard, free from the threat of danger, pain, or harm. Each episode, founder Damian Andrews explores the principles underpinning Share.Care and invites expert special guests to share their knowledge so you can easily reap the benefits so many others experience. You hold the choice to create your future. Let it be with strong, healthy, and inspiring relationships. Hello and welcome to a Pondering Life episode of the Shared.Care podcast. Our belief is that global peace starts at home. Feeling safe, valued and heard gives you a foundation to confidently step out and make the world a happier and safer place for everyone. Because in today's world, it's in your own selfish best interest to help others. Now, today I'm discussing with Jason Priest about men and asking for help and showing emotions. G'day, Jason. Good to see you again. Hey, likewise, man. I'm excited. Same, same. Uh, for the viewers, we've just had a bit of a rant on a different topic, but today we're here to, um, we're talking about uh, men asking for help and expressing their feelings, which I'm a bit, you know, from my background, I kind of, um, maybe I've missed a little bit of that as well. I know there's a, um, you know, some men have problems with that and, and, uh, and don't ask for the, for for help, and there's that macho attitude. I guess I probably missed a little bit of that. I had a very strong mum um, growing up who was very influential in that side of things, and and I mean she was. When you look at things, she, yeah, after World War Two, uh, she was in Australia one the first female automotive apprentice. So she was outside of the norm of what normal people you know would expect for those stereotypes um even though you know later which well, later she became a, a stay-at-home mom because she wanted to um but she was always doing things that, that stepped out of the norm and and for me you know I, was, I grew up with that environment of of being part of a uh, i was very much in touch with my feminine side if, if you want to say that that would be a way of doing it so for me it was all never, good it was never an issue to um you know to to um to to sort of ask for help and, and express feelings to a certain degree. So I, di- I didn't have that whole, this is a macho thing to to do that. But I know that exists because I've seen that with friends um, that I've had as well. Uh, but, you know, I mean, obviously, but from your experience, what, what's it, you know, what was it like for you growing up? Did you, do you have that same, you know, macho thing or did, what was it, what did you experience? I experienced something similar to you. However, um, I'll kind of lay mine out. Like I grew up in a single parent household. I did have a dad in my life. My parents Mm. got divorced around when I was like two or three. Mm. Um, We uh, we were living in Michigan and we moved to Texas and I've been in Texas since. My father um, was a active participant in my life when it came to my soccer playing. Mm. Uh, Aside from that, um, you know, he had the every other weekend kind of visitation and um, as I got older, I had a lot of resentment around my dad because he was a very overbearing when it came to the soccer field. Mm. Um, and you know, it, it, um, he did some things that really mess with my head as a, as a kid growing up playing soccer and, and that consumed mm. a lot of my life. Um, and so I lived with my mom and grew up in a single parent household with my mom, but my mom had a lot of issues herself. Um, my mom had uh, a lot of depression and anxiety. Mm. My mom was a alcoholic. My mm. mom smoked in the house. And so I didn't have a lot of a true guidance. She did her best, right? Like yeah. she did her best. And she did get remarried when I, when she, when I, or when I was, 
I want to say like around 13, she got remarried, but I never saw that guy as a father figure, right? He was always just my stepdad. Um, mm. And he was pretty lenient on what I did. And so I pretty much had free reign of the house, um, got into a lot of trouble, did went down my own path. Mm. Um, and so for me, um, growing up, uh, you know, playing soccer and and kind of going growing up in the the time that I did the, the day and age that I did. Uh, I'm 43 now. Um, I was always told that uh, anytime I got an injury in soccer, uh, anytime I showed emotions in soccer, uh, anytime I showed emotions really in any sport. That wasn't the only sport that I that I played, but that was my primary sport. Mm-hmm. And uh, the reality is, is growing up, I was always told that big boys don't cry. Uh, mm-hmm. To rub some dirt on it, it'll be okay, right? I remember. Uh, I remember one time when I, you know, I got, I, 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 uh, sprained my ankle pretty bad and yeah. uh, I got up and I was limping and, um, you know, like my, my, my coach says to me, I'll rub some dirt on it. It'll be okay. Like, it's like the, the classic line when, when a, when a boy gets hurt and they're not supposed to show emotions. Right. Mm. And so that's the, that's the, uh, the, the era that I grew up in. Um, and we'll dive more into that, man. But, but I grew up, you know, like you, it's, it was a very, um, I was in, I, I don't know that I was in touch with my feminine side as much. Um, and I never, never had, uh, and never had any issue with that, but it was more like, I didn't have that, um, that consistent male presence in my life to really show me the ropes when it came to being a man. And, and that's, and I will never in my life, like my, my dad and I have mended our relationship a bit. I will never in my life uh, give him any credit for uh, the man that I am today because he played no role in that. I had to find myself in order to do that, uh, which is sad. But but yeah, that's that was kind of my my background. Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? Because I, I didn't have that like from my dad. My mom was always the authoritarian in the house. She was the one with a wooden spoon. And if you did something wrong, she sure. you know, <laughs> whack. And, and I, I joked once there when it broke that I farted when she hit me. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. And um but my dad, I, I actually don't even remember my dad yelling at me. I, I know there was times where he was upset at me, um, but I don't remember him actually you know, being really, really yelling at me a lot um, or, or yelling at all. But, you know, and um, it's kind of something maybe that's because I mentioned before on, the, on this show that I've, I've never yelled at my son either. And, and, and I think maybe that's partly why. Uh, not to say that I've never got angry because I've certainly got angry in my life and, and sure. had my fair of, of yelling matches. Uh, but it's just like from that perspective of having, you know, expressing feelings, I, I, when I was thinking back about it, you know, with my dad and, and asking for help, that was the hardest thing I ever had to do once. There was a time where I was in a, in a difficult situation, certainly financially with the things that were going on. And to ask my dad for help was, was one of the hardest things that I, I recall doing. It was, uh, I need help. And I, and I was like, okay, how do I ask my dad for help? And and I did and actually got a very good response and and I think it probably helped our relationship as well. Like, you know, most parents and children, you go through your phases as a young kid and then sure. as a teenager, you know, I kind of went and rebelled. And I think partly too because I moved away. Um, so I left home at 18, joined the army, and then when I had the opportunity to go to the other side of the country, I, I took that opportunity. Um, so I didn't really have, you know, that I guess a lot of that rebellion side of things, I went out and created my own, my own way. Um, and it was even when I was in the army, you know, it was friends I'd, and male friends that we knew and, and we could hug each other, no problem. And it wasn't an issue. Uh, I was also, um, you know, involved. I was in Western Australia at the time and they have the West Australian Academy of Performing Arts and, and Hugh Jackman was there when I was going there doing some some art classes. So I knew Hugh Jackman before his Wolverine, Wolverine you know, and he was, a lot, <laughs> yeah, <I love> it. <laughs> he was a lot skinnier then. I got this photo of us having dinner together and this is this scrawny little guy that <laughs> he was back then. Um, but it was... Yeah, it was uh, so. That's where I was just wondering from that perspective of, of you know, because you deal with a lot of dads, and and mm-hmm. you know, what what do you feel? You know, because there, there is that there is a I know there is a men, uh, mentality out there that men don't express feelings. You shouldn't express feelings. Um, what what's your experience in dealing with the dads? What what how do they how do they address that? Or what what is their experience that they've shared with you? Yeah, great question, man. And I'll be honest with you. <clears throat> Pretty much every every uh, every dad that I speak to um, literally recites what I just told you, and I'll kind of walk you through that because my um, our mm-hmm. demographic uh, is thirty five to forty five, right? Like most guys, mm-hmm. most dads are going to fall mm-hmm. somewhere in there. We, you know, and, and 
uh, we we serve uh, dads that are older than that. We have several dads in our community, but like in terms of our advertising and and that kind of thing, that we're we're looking for guys with um, with kids that are still you know an uh, integral part of the family, not the guys that you know, have the the 18 and 19 year olds that are kind of going out on their own and they're kind of in the next phase of their life. Um, and so we help those guys too, but most of our guys are 35 to 45. And so when you're talking about those guys, they all came from a similar era that I did. My business partner, let's mm -hmm. see, I'm 30, 43. I think he's 34. I think I've got him by about almost 10 years. He had the similar experiences. And so it was a very, very um, common trend to, and this is all pre- uh, participation trophy era, right? Like now it's participation trophies <laughs> and all inclusive and uh, inclusivity. And we'll yeah, get there. We'll, in a we'll, we'll kick the goal, but we won't yeah, yeah. keep score. Not that everyone else on the sideline yeah, yeah. is keeping score exactly. anyway. Like <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm sorry, but a seventh and eighth place uh, trophy means absolutely nothing to me. And um, I had a long conversation with my son. My my son, uh, my my son is not. He's athletic in a sense, mm. but he's not involved in uh, he's not engaged with uh, team sports he's a karate guy and like does his own thing he's a very athletic kid mm -hmm. um but when we had him in some team sports uh, they gave him a, a a trophy and there was no first place anything there was just everybody gets a trophy and i had a long conversation about him with that i said man i'm gonna let you know this and like i don't know how involved and, and luckily like he hasn't really taken to the team sports thing i have a two-year-old who seems like he's gonna be the one that's gonna be the athletic kid Mm. kid's got a cannon he's throwing stuff in our house and breaking stuff <laughs> i am not proud of this at all uh on sunday I'll, I'll just throw this little thing in there on sunday um all in all in one shot within like two hours of each other he took the remote control for our bed we've got one of those beds that can do like the zero gravity or whatever he took the remote control and just threw it across my room hits yeah. the wall and literally shatters the remote i had to literally piece it back together to get this <laughs> thing back up so yeah. i'm frustrated Literally two hours later, uh, little man, and my wife is sitting on the couch having a glass of champagne. Mm. He goes up because uh, she'd gotten her chores done for the day and she's all like excited to chill. He goes up, grabs the champagne gla uh, glass, champagne glass, picks it up and just throws it down on the table and shatters the champagne glass. And I'm like, dude, what's going on here? So yeah. we think he's going to be the athlete. But yeah. um, anyway, going back to what I was saying, we grew up in a day and age where um, men don't show emotions, right? Mm. Uh, men are supposed to be, uh, you know, proud, brave protectors, um, but we're not supposed to show emotions. That's a sign of a, of, of weakness, right? Mm. The whole big boys don't cry mentality. Uh, the whole rub your dirt on, uh, rub some dirt on it. Uh, it'll be okay mentality. And what that's done for our country has led to a massive mental health problem uh, in men, because men are afraid to ask for help now. Uh, mm. I would imagine that some of your audience, um, even if they didn't grow up in in America, um, your your audience, some some of the men that listen to this, are going to resonate with this. Because how many times have you guys been driving around, you get lost, and you refuse to stop and ask the gas station clerk for directions? <laughs> You're stubborn. We're going to figure it out on our own. Yeah. Right. If I think back in my life, how many times that's happened to me, mm -hmm. I'd imagine like I've probably wasted literally days because I'm 43. <laughs> and so if I go back and I let add up the 30 yeah. minutes here, the hour here, the, the 20 minutes here, yeah. um, I've probably wasted days of my life looking for something, looking for a place because I was lost simply because I refused to stop and ask for directions because it's been conditioned into my head that I'm not supposed to ask for help. I'm supposed to figure it out on my own. Now we have a massive problem with men, with men's groups, with men's communities. And literally every dad that I speak to, we brought on a new client yesterday into the fatherhood. And I think I've told you we have several different programs. Our top tier program is the fatherhood. Yeah. And he was very aligned. I could tell as soon as we got on the phone or on Zoom, I was like, hey, man, you know, tell me what's going on. And within minutes, I told him right away. I was like, hey, dude, I I'm just going to tell you right now. Um, I we would love to have you in the fatherhood. You're very aligned with what we do. Um, this guy was, he's, he's desperate for that sense of community, right? He's desperate to mm. have relationships with other men because he doesn't have outlets. Uh, this gentleman uh, has dealt with, um, he just got, he just had the, the birth of his third child. And then a month later, his uh, father passed away. So he's got yeah. an emotional roller coaster going on at home. Uh, he's got a wife that, that does her thing. He took a little bit of time off to have uh, with his new kid. 
and he doesn't have any outlets. He doesn't have mm. any support. He doesn't have anybody that he can turn to and, and just vent, just talk to. And yeah. when I told him that, he's been in the group now for a day. We welcomed him in today. I let him in yesterday. And he's already, we could tell, he's already all about it. All these bonds are being formed. Guys are there to lift him up, say, hey, man, we got your back. This is a safe space. If you need to be vulnerable, please do. If you want to celebrate a win, we're here to help you. We're here to pat you on the back when you're winning. But we're here to lift you up uh, when times are tough for you. And, and that's what I try to tell all of our guys. It's like, this community is super vulnerable. We've got guys going through cancer treatments right now. We got guys going through divorce. We got guys, we have one guy that lost his son to cancer. Um, mm. So it's a very vulnerable group. And men just don't have that. We're starving for that connection, that sense of community. Um, yeah. and, and that's what I see most in our guys. I uh, had a guy email me today. He's like, hey, man, uh, I put out an offer on Facebook today. I was like, hey, I've opened up some time today and tomorrow just to add value to your life. And I don't ever do this because my obviously, just like you, my time is valuable. But I want to give. I'm a giver. And I said, you know what? If any, I highly doubt anybody takes me up on this offer because most of you guys are lazy. You don't want to get to you don't want to do the hard work and you're going to keep scrolling. But if you do want help, this is all value, no pitch. Let's see who takes me up on this. Right. Most guys are going to keep scrolling, man. They, mm. they, they're they afraid to ask for help, but I have to put that out there. I had a guy email me, respond to my email. He goes, hey, man, if I'm super depressed and have a lot of anxiety, can you help me? And I'm mm. like, that's the question I get most. It's the mental health. All it's it's the mental health and then the physical health, which most yeah. guys don't realize that the physical health comes before the mental health. You got it. They, they work in tandem. You got to address <laughs> the physical health to feel better mentally and vice versa, right? And yes. so that's what I see most in in the guys that we speak to on a regular basis. Yeah, having that outlet is really important because said from my experience, and, and as you know, I was posted to the SAS, which is in Australian Special Forces. Um, I spent a lot of time there with with the guys there, and. Yeah, it said my experience with those guys, and we also did work with the TRG as well. I mean, these guys were really tough. They, were, you know, as far as macho yep. goes, they, they were macho. Um, yep. But they weren't your, your typical, you know, video macho. And I just wonder whether we lost track there of what is real macho. And and because th- we have the same thing here. There's a lot of you know, th- there's a lot of push now to get men to open up and and talk. And uh, what I found interesting once was we had a um with one of the works that I was doing, I was the CEO of the Family Peace Foundation. We were filming um, and doing, uh, asking questions about, um, about you know, life, how we deal with life. We had a whole bunch of people around a, a table. We had some key psychologists asking questions. We were filming this. And I got concerned because we had, um, I was, what I was, because I was directing it, I noticed that a lot of men were starting to do the talking. And I was really uh, got concerned because I thought, oh, the, you know, you get the thing that men are dominating the conversation. Uh, mm-hmm. I got that from the corporate world. And and so I said to the ladies off camera because we were rotating people in into the camera, I said, I'm concerned that the, the men are doing all the conversation. And they all stood up and said, no, we never hear men talking about this stuff. We're loving listening. And I was like, well, is that what it takes? Is it, do we need to have this safe environment where men can talk and, and, and feel free to talk? Uh, are men, you know, are they not only being, you know, from society, you know, not should say society, from, you know, the, the, the male um, norm of, you know, you don't express feelings, but it is also something that's, that's pushed on them by, by women as well it's it's a societal thing where it's it's not just dads that are saying to their sons you know don't don't express emotions or that's the norm but it was it was society as a whole do you think that's part of that that problem 100 percent. right now in our country um we have uh this major um this major uproar about toxic masculinity all right. <laughs> yeah. And I've we're told that, that it, which is the biggest crock of sh- I don't know if we do, you, do we, we cuss on this show. It's a, yeah, it's you the, can. yeah we're, we're fine. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm not going to drop it. A bunch I don't of think shit's a, but gonna, I don't think shit's a swear word. <laughs> OK, OK, well, good. Look, I, 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 like I, tell I mean, my how wife, many times have you ever seen someone picking that up off the street as they're walking their dog? <laughs> there you go. Right. It's shit. It is what it is. I will tell you that uh, I tell my wife all the time, like, look, you got to realize that I'm not like the, I, I don't love to cuss all the time. That's not who I am. But some things need a cuss word at the end to yeah. make sure that you get the the the, uh, the the power of what I'm saying here, right? Like yeah. for lack of a better term. 
Um, well, if Tony so, Robbins can do it in his seminars, and he does it a lot of times, I saw when he's live seminars, I'm go. like, oh my god, he's swearing, he's you know, he's swearing like a trooper. Yeah, yeah. there you go. <laughs> so uh, this is the biggest bunch of shit that I've ever heard, though, with the toxic masculinity. Because here's the thing: there's no such thing as toxic masculinity. You yeah. have you have assholes, and you have nice people. That can be a woman. That can be a man. Right. Yeah. Anybody can be a dick. Right. Like yeah. you, you don't you don't necessarily have to be a, a man. To be a to be a, a, a bad person or to be a, a a hateful person, so there's nothing toxic about being masculine, right? Mm. Let's not let's separate those two terms because if you're a toxic person, I get it, right? You're a negative. Mm. You always have negative things to say. You you're judging people all the time. You're you're just a toxic person. Yeah. Toxic and masculinity don't go together. That if you say toxic masculinity and the guy's just being a dick, he's just a dick. Yeah. But don't don't let tell me that being masculine has anything to do with being a good or a nice person. They just don't. And so mm. when we're told that toxic masculinity, like you 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 know you you um we we've um we have this big push on inclusivity in my country, right? Yeah. Uh, this is a major play uh, right now, and and I won't get into to why I believe this is happening, but uh, this is this is part of the agenda. Okay, mm. so you're you're essentially in our country. Strong men mm. are uh, generally anti-government and vice versa, right? Strong, uh, strong, focused, purposeful men that mm. take care of themselves, lead by example for their families, prioritize themselves and their families. They're not just a provider, but they're also a protector. They take mm. care of their physical health. They're leaders in the community. They're leaders for their family. They are genuine, nice people. But they're masculine in a way that they, you know, they they have their they know their core values, right? They mm. operate out of a they operate out of a different mindset, right? Yeah. Generally speaking, those guys are purpose driven. They're career driven, whatever their purpose is, and they're a man on a mission, just like you and me. You're a man on a mission. You want to yeah. change lives. I'm a man on a mission. I want to change lives. Me, a person like me, and I'm not even as masculine as they come. Uh, a person like me is not easily controlled by the government. I don't fit into their system, right? I'm not a uh, a product of society. I did not come up into in, in their their educational system and take out a hundred thousand dollar loan for an art degree and become indebted to them for life and become a product of their system. I'm over here, and they mm. don't like that, right? So when you start talking about toxic masculinity, you start to make guys like me um, almost. It, it's almost like the uh, the term political correctness, right? It's not PC. It's not politically correct. You shouldn't say that, right? Mm. Uh, it's also kind of like the silent majority. Well, the silent majority believes this. The more you feed the silent majority or the more you feed toxic masculinity, the more those people are going to be quiet, right? They don't, it, it's, they don't want the backlash from society. And so when you feed men... You're toxic. You're it's toxic masculinity. You get guys like me who start to become afraid, afraid to ask for help because if we do, um, you know, it's it's we're not we're supposed to be big, proud, brave, and, and shut up, right? And mm. it's it's a it's a chronic issue in our in our country. And again, I, I this is a, a a full agenda, but we're not easily controlled, and that's not that's not what they don't want. That right? The the powers that be uh don't like that they don't like strong willed people that uh want to go out and create wealth for their family and that can become independent of their system and so um i think a big part of it is that at least in my country but when you're told as a man that um you know uh, your whole life that big boys don't cry and you're not supposed to show emotions and you're supposed to internalize all that because you're a man and you can figure it out um you have a major problem with men being afraid to ask for help and it's uh it's sad because I, again i see it every day it's interesting that you point it that way because I hadn't heard that. I mean, I've heard toxic masculinity being used a lot, and whenever someone was questioned to explain that, what 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 was toxic masculinity, no one's ever been able to do it that I've seen, sure. and sure. not not in a way that says it's a male thing. Anyway, they'll, they'll explain and go, "Well, yeah, women can do that too," and it's yeah. And so there it's, you go. It's, it, as you said, it's you know, being toxic is toxic. So there hasn't been a, a definition of toxic masculinity that that I've seen anyway that that isolates it to men. And but I do wonder, and it comes back to what I, I'm I experienced with 
the you know creating that environment where the women want it they're going because you have on one hand you know there's a number of women they go well we want you know we, we men don't express emotions and then and then when they do they're going men are not tough enough um and so it's you you kind of you get that that dual-edged sword but i'm wondering mm-hmm. again with that that having that environment do do we need to have well, well i think we do need to have it it shouldn't be really a question but what you're doing is creating an environment where men can can open up and talk because men, men do want to talk we we do have things to say we we just i think if you've been i mean if you've been indoctrinated uh, over the years that you can't open up to have those first steps to go, well, is it okay to do that? For me, I don't care. I'll say what I want to say, and if you don't like it, mm-hmm. uh, and 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 it's it's kind of interesting how many women, um, and and in the, I don't like the the term feminist, but in the the e- equalist space, I'm going to use the equalist mm-hmm. space. Mm-hmm. It, how many women in the equalist space I have support from because I um you know I, I'm I'm talking with them and we're all talking openly, we're sharing. And they they like that, and I have very a lot of women friends in that space that that love having those conversations. And they love that I can have that conversation with them. Do you think it's you know from that perspective too partly about how we how we talk about it? Whether we because sometimes and and I get this men, men have testosterone, and we were mentioning this before you know we we started recording, mm-hmm. um, and so that can make us. Probably, and and I get this from when when I was married, um, my my wife at the time, yeah, you know, she mentioned that her and her daughters thought, you know, wh- why was I always yelling at them? And it was, and it wasn't that I was yelling; it was because of how I spoke to them. It sounded like because I spoke to other people, and go, am I yelling all the time? And and they go, no. And it's just, but you you are loud. And, mm-hmm. and it was, and so I'm, I'm putting it. And so I took that on board and, and I learned to speak softly to the point sometimes where I had to speak up because I couldn't hear. Sure. But, yeah. but I'm just wondering, is it something where we, where we need to be on, on both sides, we need to have that experience of being, okay, we, we need to be able to talk and share what we're doing, but we need to be mindful of that. And, and I'm relaying that back to when I grew up, my mum always said, she said, and, and so I'm very, very grateful for how my mum brought me up in the sense she said, look, because I had a sister who was a year younger. Um, uh, and there was a point where she was taller than me, which I was really annoyed with <laughs> and when she was taller than me. But, it, but she said to me, she said, when you two are playing, you're a man, you're much stronger. You need to be careful how you play so you don't accidentally hurt her. because what could be normal for you could be could hurt her and so do we need to balance it with that side of thing going okay guys you need to be strong um, but you need to be mindful of where you're strong and how you're being strong so that you don't accidentally hurt someone is that something we need to consider as well yeah and i um i do and i think that you know and, and like we mentioned before the show i think open discussion about issues like these um, I, I think it, it, you know, at the at the root cause of all this is a cultural issue, um, mm. and whether you know whether or not you know you you want to believe that it's intentional or not, it's it's really a moot point. It's it, it is a cultural issue though at its core, and you talk about the the feminists, right? And you talk about uh, we we talk about toxic masculinity. Um, the reality is, is if you ask most women, like if you if you polled, let's say you polled a million women, right? Mm. Um, how many of those women do you feel like if they're if they're seeking out a man? How many of those women do you think they're that are going to say, you know, I, I'm I'm seeking out a man who's um, more feminine, um, has a dad bod, doesn't have high testosterone, and uh, you know is, is going to be more of a provider than a protector for me, and um, is really not going to be leading by example for our kids, being a strong male because he's soft, weak, and and has low T, right? Mm. Like that sounds absurd. Right. That, yeah. that that question just sounds absurd. A million people. How many women do you think would choose that type of man? Mm. Um, I'd venture to say it all. It would be almost zero. But there, there's obviously some freaks out there who is <laughs> some weird <laughs> people out there who would who would choose that uh, just just despite the, the poll. Mm. Uh, so the reality is, is that inherently, um, you know, as a species, women seek out the strongest man to mate with so that they can continue their bloodline moving forward. This is biology. This is biology 101. This is animal kingdom stuff, right? You're not going to have a, a, a lion. A, a, you know, if we're talking about lions, like if he's, a, if he's the king of the jungle or, or however we want to we, mm. we verbalize that, you got two male lions 
that want to mate with the with a female, uh, which which male lion is gonna is the female gonna pick? Uh, the one that's soft and weak and not not as strong as the other one, or the one that's strong and dominant and is going to mm. be able to give her a better bloodline moving forward, so that they can continue uh, their you know their genes pushing forward, uh, creating a healthy bloodline, right? So we when we when we, when we take that to the human level and you think about it on a human level. Uh, generally speaking, most women are going to want a strong, healthy, masculine man that can do his share, pull his weight in the marriage, right? Mm. Women, and I'm not, I, I'm not going to tell you that women aren't capable of, of everything that men do, right? And vice versa. But yeah. let's be honest. There are certain, there are certain tasks, there are certain things in life that men are going to be doing a little bit better than women, right? And that's not undermining a woman's strength or any of that. But like, if my wife needs me to uh, to pick up a heavy box in the garage, right? Um, and I'm not capable of that. Is she going to call like a, a helper? She's going to look online and, 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 gets, and hire somebody to come pick up the box for her because her husband's not capable of doing this? Like, when you start to bring these type of scenarios up, it's insane that we have this toxic masculinity uh, talk. And so uh, going back to your question, I think communication around this and bringing it to the surface level um, and, and even talking with women about it, because I, I do a lot of, um, you know, masculine posts about uh, what it means to be a man and a father and a role model and a leader and, and all this around on Facebook. And you would see, you'd, you, you know, you'd be shocked at the amount of women that come onto those posts and say, you know what, we love this. I love everything about this post. Please put it, keep, please keep putting out this content. We need more men in, in society like this because the masculine strong man is becoming rare in society. And that's a scary thought process when you think about it, because it, going mm. back to agenda or not, uh, weak men uh, don't don't lead to uh, to to good times, and I, I'm sure you've heard the the little uh, the little saying before. Um, what is it? Uh, I'll have to find it on my phone. It's um, I, I have it written down. It's like how uh, I, I think you probably know what what I'm what I'm talking what I'm referring to. But like weak men lead to weak times or something tough times or something like that. I'll find it. I have it written down. But um, yeah, like I, I think. When when I start hearing women talk about you know when I when I hear women talk about you know the desire for strong men in society it leads me to believe that a lot of this is you know a lot of this uh, is is mainstream media driven on the terminology used and and the the labels that we put on people mm -hmm. uh, especially men and and it's uh, again it's sad and I, I got nothing else to say in regards to the sadness part because um, it takes conversations like these. Uh, to, tr to to raise awareness around this, but also to let guys know that it is okay to ask for help um, and that there are safe spaces out there. You've just got to gotta know where to look because they are becoming fewer and fewer and far between. But is that a case too, of like from a, a man's perspective, you know, we're talking about being a strong man. I mean, being a strong man is, to me, is being able to ask for help. I can, you know, and in the same token, from that perspective, I can express emotions. I, I do it with my dad all the time. Whenever I see my dad, um, no matter where we are, I'll give him a big hug and say, hey, dad, love you. And and he says the same to me. And I do it with my son as well. You know, whenever, you know, there's times where you know, take my son to, to camp, for example, he's going on school camp and you've got everybody there with all the buses lined up. And as we go, I give him a big hug and say, hey, man, love you, have fun. Um, so being able to express that emotion to, to my son and showing him that, um, you know, to me, I see that as strength. Uh, I, I can do that. I, I'm going to do what's right for me, regardless of what anyone else thinks. Um, mm -hmm. And to, to me, that's strength. And, and again, and I've got to credit my mum for that because she, and I hated it as a kid. <laughs> you know, she yeah. was like, it doesn't matter what anyone else thinks. You, you, you've got to do what's right for you. And it's like, um, but is that, you know, is that more what we need to be saying? Hey, it's you, you need to do what's right for you, not what, you know, society says. And, and you need to do it because that is what's strong. You need to stand up, you know, if there's an injustice, not just go along with it. And, you know, I mean, because you look at it from the extreme level, Let, let's look at um, uh, there, there were so many people, the reports are read of, you know, going back to World War II and 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 the, the Nazis. And there were so many people that were part of that that actually didn't agree with it, but went along with it. 
Yep. Um, rather yep. than you know, is that what we need to be teaching? That is strength, not hiding your feelings, but saying, "Hey, mm-hmm. this pisses me off. Um, we need to do something about it." Is is that what we need to be teaching? I one hundred percent yes. Think that that is the path forward. Is that you know, like <clears throat> if you think about it on a grand scale here, where we're at right now compared to where we could or need to be. Like if you're if you're Think about the a man, right? And a man who's hurting inside, right? Yeah. Whether it's his physical health, his mental health, his marriage, whatever it may be. And mm. he internalizes this for years and he doesn't he doesn't ask for help and he 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 continues to stay stuck, right? Mm. Let's say let's use physical health for an example because I come from the ICU. So you have a guy like that who let's say he's 30 pounds overweight and he knows he needs help, doesn't know where to start, has tried some things. Um and just continues to kick the can down the road because he's afraid to ask for help, right? He kicks the can for a little bit too long uh, yeah. and it ends up having a massive heart attack. Goes into the ICU, doesn't die, but use, loses uh, a large portion of his heart muscle function, right? Uh, we yeah. call it ejection fraction in the ICU. So now this man is in basically heart failure the rest mm-hmm. of his life. And his family has to pay the price, both financially, physically, emotionally, all of that that ro- rolls around that. Uh, and now he's uh, basically uh, at some point going to become a burden on his family because now they're going to have to take care of him instead of him taking care of them. Right. So you have that example. You reverse that and you say, mm-hmm. this man, he's 30 pounds overweight. He knows he needs help. And within a few weeks, instead of kicking the can down the road, he asks for help. Yeah. He finds the help he needs. He fixes his problem. He loses the weight. He optimizes all areas of his health. He's performing at a high level every day. And now he's moved up in his career. His his marriage has gotten better. His He's leading by example for his kids. And he's living his life on fire, right? Yeah. Which one would you say is the stronger man, right? Which label would you get? Like one of them folded. One of them owned their shit, took full responsibility for their self. And ask for help. Yeah. Which one would you say is the stronger man? Right? Definitely. I mean, the person that asks for help is always, in my mind, is the stronger person. This is, you know, this is the point we're trying to get across. It's like ha- I, I'm, I'm still always flabbergasted because I'd never had a problem asking for help. I, I remember, um, or asking when I wanted to know something as well. Mm-hmm. You know, I remember when I was in the army, I had a, a number of, um, you know, uh, because we worked long hours during the day. We, we worked a seven day fortnight. So I, I had a, you know, seven days off in a fortnight to do, do stuff with. Now, some of that I went to the pub and had a bit of fun and, you know, played pool and that, but there was other things sure. I wanted to do as well. And so I was like, oh, I want to learn marketing. So I went out and, and knocked on doors and said to, to marketing well, firms, can you, and I must have looked like a complete twat, you know, because it's just so unconventional, but it was like, I didn't care what they thought. I didn't even think about what they thought. I said, it's just, I wanted to do this. And and one guy took me in as he had a small marketing firm. He took me in and, and I got to direct commercials and write, you know, copy for ads. And he was teaching me all this stuff, but you know, I was, I was just happy to go out there and ask for help. I mean, do, do we need to be encouraging people as well to say, Hey, it doesn't matter. Like, if, if you get a knockback, I remember in the army, it was, it was great. There was one guy, <laughs> I don't know if I told you the story or not, but he was always dating these really, you know, uh, like beautiful women. And when I say beautiful, I mean, wholly beautiful. They were highly intelligent. So they were doctors and um, sure. you know, lawyers and stuff like that, that he was dating. And and they were, they were like, you know, they'd seen, we meet them, they'd be gorgeous, these gorgeous, physically gorgeous, mentally gorgeous women. But he was a bit of a douchebag, as in like dumb. He was a bit dumb. <laughs> and, uh, well, that's our opinion. And, and I, one day I said to him, I said, hey, uh, I, I had to find out how he was doing this. And um, so I went up to him. I said, Shane, how is it How is it that you're – I said, you're not that bright. I actually said that to him. <laughs> you're not that bright. How is it you're dating all these gorgeous women? And he turned into this like – wise Obi-Wan type character. He put his arm around my shoulder and he said, Damien, what you don't see is I ask a lot. Most of them say no. You just see the ones that say yes. And it was That's funny. Too, yeah, it was it was a light bulb moment for me to always ask the question. Um, but I, I'm wondering, do we do we need to be encouraging people that to just hey, ask it. this is part of asking for help. It's like, well, I, I want to do something. Um we'll get to that part as well, having a goal to start with. 
encouraging people to do that. But I want to do something. Just just ask the question. If you if you get a no, so what? Move on to the next person. Do do we need to be encouraging? I love that. I love that. Uh, I love the story. First of all, I think that's awesome because the the answer is always going to be no if you don't ask, right? Um, <laughs> exactly. So it's it's kind of like the the what is that? The I think Wayne Gretzky, the old hockey player, has the. Yeah saying of like you know uh you, you keep shooting until you score right it's like something around you know yeah. shoot shoot your shot over and over and over again and you take as many shots and eventually you're gonna hit one it's like uh you know the kind of the fish in the sea thing right you keep you, you throw your hook out enough with the bait on yeah. it and you're gonna catch a fish um, and you miss, I, as you, I think it was you miss 100 percent of the shots you don't take that you don't take there you go yeah yeah perfect yeah. um and so yes i think that 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 is a you know i think that analogy is good um but i also think that what we've got to realize here is um, a big, you know, a, a big roadblock for a lot of guys is their ego. And that ego, yeah, yeah. that ego grows over the years. And what you feed your ego uh, is what eventually will, will lead to you, your decision making in the future, right? Like if you mm. have a, if your ego gets in the way of you asking for help, well, well, like, are you going to blame your ego for for the premature death because you didn't ask for help with the example that I used, right? Yeah. Are you going to blame your ego for uh, your marriage failing because you didn't ask for help or you didn't tell you didn't communicate with your wife enough to say, hey, like, I think we need to get some help with this. Maybe we could bring in somebody, marriage counselor or whatever, or somebody to come in and shed some light on our situation to help us grow as a couple. You blame your ego for that. Like, so when you when you talk about an ego and you talk about a roadblock, we're we we get very focused on the task at hand on a daily day to day basis, and we almost get caught in this you know, this this almost this rat race lifestyle, right? We get up. We um, mm. I was talking and in, in, on our fatherhood coaching call the other day. I was like, man, I I've been having deja vu a lot because I go into my I go into my closet. I put my gym clothes on every day, four days a week, Monday through Thursday. That's my very structured schedule, and I like I have a lot of deja vu because I do the same shit over and over and over again. Yeah. Right? We think about that on an ego driven level. The more that your subconscious mind gets used to you not asking for help and the, mm. you continue to feed it, hey, um, I'm I'm good. I don't need to ask for help. I'll figure this out on my own, figure this out on my own. Well, now, like your subconscious mind believes that you're not going to ask for help, whether you're going to figure it out on your own or not. And it becomes it becomes very easy now to not ask for help. Right. The same uh, the same holds true with, um, you know, with, with when you have, you know, your you're going at life, right? And you mm. you get up every day and you tell yourself you you want to get healthier. And yeah. I'm going to start going to the gym on Monday. And you do this for several weeks in a row and you don't go to the gym on Monday. Well, mm. now your subconscious mind starts to believe that you're a liar. So two things happen. Not only are you getting further and further away from your goal, but now your subconscious mind believes that you're a liar. So each excuse gets easier and easier and easier every time you make it, right? That yeah. talking yourself out of the gym on Monday becomes very easy to do when you've done it eight times versus the first time, right? Yeah. And so you have to keep that in mind is that what you fuel your mind with is really going to be how your life, how your life is going to unfold. And if you're feeding your mind the right things, you're feeding you in this situation. Um, I am, I'm a man, but it's okay to ask for help. And you're telling yourself this, I do need to look for help in these areas. I do need to get better because if I get the right help, it's going to launch my life forward. And I'm going to get out of this stuck, miserable position that I'm in right now. Well, like weigh the circumstances, right? Would you rather stay stuck and miserable because your ego and your subconscious mind are saying, we don't ask for help? Or would you rather start to believe that it's okay to ask for help, speak up, and then actually be able to move forward in life? I ask for help all the time now in business. I was scared at first. I didn't want to look dumb and I didn't want to look like I didn't know what I was doing. But like, that's the game of life. And when you, when you, uh, when you start to realize that there's, there's, it's the little things in life that matter most, um, asking for help becomes uh, almost second nature because it's like, if I can ask for help from the right person, I'm going to save myself a lot of anxiety, a lot of time, a lot of frustration, and I can move forward. I'll, uh, an example in our business. I am, uh, I know enough about click funnels to be dangerous, but I'm not like a, I'm not a click funnels pro, right? Yeah. We've got several funnels we use, but there are like four active funnels. And my business partner and I have decided this year, we made a lot of bad hires last year. Um, we outsourced a lot of stuff that we probably should have kept in, in, in house. Yeah. Um, it cost us a lot, right? Like we, we spent a lot of resources, a lot of time, frustration, money, all yada, yada. And so this year we made a commitment to do everything in house. And we were going over the things that we were going to outsource. And we will only outsource now if it's a vetted source 
and it's a a guaranteed thing like hey I guarantee this will happen. And if it doesn't, you know, you don't pay, right? We yeah. love those scenarios because that means your work is on the line and yeah. you have to prove yourself. I'm yeah. not going to come in and pay your $5,000 agency retainer fee for you to run ads for my company when I don't know if they're going to work or not, right? So those these agency fees are, are outlandish these days with some of the things that these guys promise and under deliver. We have a lot of over promising and under delivering in our marketing world. Uh, which is it, it, it's it's maddening. Oh, it's massive so, online. That that's huge. It, it, it's bad. That, it's yeah, bad. Yeah. You know, it, 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 they'll they'll sh- tell you that they could do all these things for you, and it's gonna it's only gonna and be stuff 10K. that you could do yourself very quickly and easily anyway. If you ask the question, <laughs> right? If you ask the question, you got to know that you got to you got to first say, okay, it's okay to ask for help. Yeah. And so we were decided, hey, you know what? Um, I know that I can get these funnels done, but these funnels are gonna take me two months. And they're going to take somebody, a pro on Upwork, two days, right? Yeah. So I'm going to go pay a couple hundred bucks to Upwork per a person, save myself the time, money, and resources that mm. it was going to cost me because my time is more valuable serving our clients. Uh, and then the funnel's done in two days, right? And so yeah. I ask for help all the time now. That's just a, a small example. But man, like it has changed my perspective when it comes to asking for help because I used to be scared. I was the guy that you know, big boys don't cry. I'm not supposed to ask for help. I'm supposed to figure it out on my own. Again, I've wasted days driving around lost, not, not asking for directions. <laughs> so yeah, I, I found that, uh, I found that saying, and I think we're at the cycle now and it's hard times create strong men, mm. strong men create good times, good times create weak men, which is where we're at right now. And then weak men create hard times, right? Which is, well, no, that's where we're at right now. So we're at the end of the cycle. Yeah. So if you, th- if you believe this cycle, which over over the span of time, right? I don't know. Each cycle is a hundred years or whatever. Um, but but we had the Great Depression here in in, in the U.S. Uh, with with the wars and things. And so hard times created strong men. We had to work our way out of that depression. Mm. Those strong men led to good times. We had a, we had great times here in America. When I was growing up in the eighties and nineties, uh, I I love those generations. Right. But those good times led to weak men. And yeah. those weak men became leaders. And our, our leadership in this country is the anti-leadership. It's the exact opposite. Those are very weak leaders. And so those weak men are now creating hard times, right? And so yeah. I don't know where where that cycle rolls over, but that was the saying that I was trying to, to trying to find earlier. And yeah. man, it, uh, it it seems like it holds true. Yeah, I love that. Um, what you're talking about there, this this creating. Well, there's a cycle there, but coming back to what you're talking about, ego as well, because I I deal with that a lot in the work that I do. Um, yeah, you know, I think it was one particular company that I, that I dealt with, and and um, they had a, a dispute because I do a lot of dispute resolution, and I I laid it out for them. I said, this is this is the trigger in the contract. Do this. Um, this happens, and and then everyone's able to litigate it's a very simple thing and it's pretty standard in most contracts you know if if you if your mediation fails um there's the next step is either a, a litigate um either litigation or arbitration or something along those lines in this case it was it was litigation it was pretty there it was straight there black and white so i put in place a process that was you know let's this is how what what i think we sh- you should do to to avoid triggering the litigation Let, let's there's a lot of issues here it was, it was 25 million dollar claim so there's a lot a lot of issues with that and i and i laid it out um and then you know the ego got in in the way of, of some of the senior management within the organization and going oh no you know we, we're not going to do that that kind of thing um and and they did the opposite that they, they they didn't they didn't listen to what was there, what was right there in front of him. It wasn't like it needed to be explained. The, the contract was pretty straightforward. Mediation fails, can litigate. What happens when you litigate? Mm-hmm. You spend a lot of money on lawyers. Oh, um, yeah. <laughs> and so they they just, they didn't, I don't know what it was, but all I can do is put it down to ego. They didn't want to listen that this was the scenario to go forward. They didn't want to to, to go, okay, what, what actually happens if we don't do that? They didn't want to explore that as to what does that mean? If 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 we cross that boundary, what does that mean? And and as much as I was trying to explain it and, and I could see it, it was just this constant, it was a it was a shut off. We're not going to listen. Mm-hmm. Um and as a result, they spent something like it's now th- this dispute is ongoing. They spent something like I think fourteen million dollars in legal fees. That's not what, and and they're likely going to they're, they're going to spend some money paying the other side anyway. There there was always oh, yeah. an obligation they had to pay something because they hadn't paid anything. Um, 
you know, it wasn't 25 million that they had to pay, but it was, I, I estimated somewhere between eight and 12. Um, so they, they've paid 14 in legal fees alone now on top of what they're going to do because their ego got in the way. They wouldn't listen. Do you think that's part of that question of, of answering that question of how to ask questions is not only do you have to ask the question, you have to be receptive to listening as well to, to what's going on. Is that part of that process that that ego kicks and goes, I don't want to do it because I might, might find out that I've got to learn something new or that I might be wrong yes. in my thinking. Yeah. And I think it's fear-based man. When you think about that, like um, you're the majority of, of hesitancy in men's lives. Let's just, let's be honest. Most of it is fear. Right. Mm. And now, you might not know where that fear stems from. Yeah. We had a guy, a gentleman, come on our uh, come come on the podcast uh, on our podcast a while back, yeah. and he also came and, and uh, did a class for our our fatherhood guys all around emotional intelligence, mm. and it was around um, emotional resolution. He calls it he calls it um, what it would eat. Oh geez, e, e e something right. He's got a little moniker on it. Um, guys, uh, he's very, uh, he's, he's from, he's French guy and he's very, very sharp in what he does. And he teaches, um, he teaches men essentially like not just men, but like well, one example that he does is he, he teaches you how to, uh, how to stop yelling at your kids, right? Yeah. You yell at your children generally from a fear, right? Yes. Or else yes. if you could stop, stop before you yell, right? Mm. Like you think about this, right? When I yell at my son. All he hears is wah, 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 right? There's no, like, he's not hearing the words that are coming out of my mouth. He sees big, angry, bear dad coming at him. Feels good for me for about 30 seconds, right? Yeah. And then I'm guilty. Then I feel the guilt about it. I'm like, man, I wish I wouldn't have yelled at my son. I, yeah. I definitely could have handled that better as a man because uh, that is not the way that I want him now, that's not the way that I want to raise my child. If I'm going to yell at him, it better be really, really bad. I don't need to be yelling at him over some nonsense, right? Yeah. And so he um, he brings it back to it's a it's a fear base, and generally speaking, it's from childhood. And he teaches you how to to stop that reaction, right? Or or to to pause for a second and be able to get through those times where you become more and more emotionally intelligent. So you're not doing these things. And that's just one example, but it, it could be with your wife, could be with your kid. And it's not just anger driven. There's other, other things he teaches, but going back to what you're, what you said, yes. Like if you're not, if you, if you believe that you can ask for help, but then you're not open to the solution, right? You're not ready for that solution. Well, then it's not re You're not ready to ask for help. Like I'll use the physical health example, right? Mm. That a guy that's 80 pounds overweight, he knows he needs to get his shit together. Okay. Yeah. And he asks for help, but he's not ready to put the work in. Mm -hmm. He wants the cut. He wants the, he wants the replacement shake or the fad diet or, you know, the celebrity workout that's going to burn 5,000 calories in 30 minutes. Right. He wants the, he wants the easy way out because he's not truly ready to put in the work. Mm -hmm. So did it serve him to ask for help in that situation? Because if he asks for help and he's not ready, is that even more of a big, a, a bigger blow to his ego? Cause it's like, yeah. well, man, I knew what the answer was going to be but I'm just not ready to put in the work and own my shit and take full responsibility for my life. Yeah. So <laughs> yeah. I'm just going to stay stuck. Right. It's like this, it's this vicious cycle. And so you have to be ready and willing to receive the help. And a lot of that, a lot of that comes from exactly what you said, listening, right. It's not just yeah. hearing what the person has to say, but it's actually listening to a potential solution. We've started a new, um, a new uh, segment on our podcast called Q and S, right? We got the, I got the idea from a podcast I listened to and it was a Q and a segment, but we, mm. we decided to name ours Q and S because we don't want to just give you an answer. We want to give you a solution, right? Yes. Most people are looking for true solutions, not just an answer to their question. Yeah. And when you start yeah, to yeah. think about it like that um, on an ego driven standpoint, your most men want a solution. Yeah. A lot of times we already know what the solution is, but if you ask for help and you're not willing to receive that, then you've got a whole nother problem. And I think that's a, a another big blow, could potentially be another big blow to your ego. Yeah, that's really important. And I love what you said there, because I think you've really touched on when you talk about fear. Um, mm -hmm. and we and we're talking about you know being strong, being a strong man. Um to to embrace fear or to not face up to your fear, that's not strength. No. That, the, and 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 that's that's I think that really underpins what this whole the the dynamic shift that we need to have is it's like being uh, facing your fear because I remember what I said I mentioned before about asking my dad for help that was that was really hard 
that was really mm-hmm. hard for me. There, there was so much to do. Not not that you know, it wasn't a fear that my dad was going to beat me or anything like that. It was my own internal ego fear that right. I had to accept I didn't know or I'd cocked or well, I'd cocked up in that case. I got myself into some debt. Um, yeah, uh, and you know, and if you're offended that I use that word, you know, think of a rooster and that'll cover it. I, I really don't care <laughs> if you're upset by that, to be honest. <laughs> post away, post away. Yeah. And um, from, but it was, that was the thing. That was my ego, my fear that, you know, I'd messed up. Maybe he might berate me because I'd I'd messed up, you know, because, you know, that was said, my dad never really yelled at me that I can recall, but he certainly berated me. <laughs> he told me I was an right. idiot many times and done something right. stupid. Um, he had no problem doing that. And so part of that, I'm, I'm wondering, I mean, as you're talking about it, is this, you know, we, we need to have that mind shift of, of, of being a man is, you know, being strong is facing fear and overcoming fear. Is that, you know, do you think that's the, the shift we have? It's not, you know, being a man is, you know, is draining your testosterone and, and not asking for it because that, that's not being a man. Um, being a man is also not yelling and screaming at your kids and and being, you know, this this um, tyrant either. Um, that, right. That's not that's not being a man in, in my view. No. You know, being this, you know, and not running around bullying people and stuff like that. Um, I, I, I remember I was listening to. There's a guy, he's an American guy, Mark Gunga. He's, a, he's a pastor. <laughs> um, he has a program called Laugh Your Way to a Better Marriage. But I remember on one of his podcasts, he was talking about, he was talking about Adam, Adam and Eve. For those, you know, from the the Bible, um, and he was saying how Adam was, he's actually Adam is the ultimate coward. He said because when you think about it, he said if you read the Bible. He said, you know, um, because they say, oh, you know, where, where would men be without women? And they say, oh, the Garden of Eve. And, and, and he's like, well, no, Adam, you know, he was he was the he was the coward. He said, when, when the snake came and gave, you know, the Eve the, the apple, um, and then Eve went and 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 she Eve turned to Adam. He, she didn't run around looking, Adam, Adam, where are you? He was right there and he did nothing. He didn't say anything, he didn't do anything about it. This is how. Mark Gunga was describing it. He said that, and that's cowardice, not standing up for what's right in that moment. Not, you know, he he, he was fearful. He was fearful that's of what cowardice. might happen and didn't say anything. Do you think that that I mean, I'm listening to what you said there before about, you know, two things you mentioned that really stood out for me was one, that fear. And that's mm-hmm. that's what being a man is facing up to fear. It do, doesn't mean you have to be physically strong. You don't need to be physically strong to save up. Um, you look at it, we mentioned World War II before. <clears throat> I mean, I look at my granddad. We didn't know any about anything about this at um, until after he died because he'd never let people talk about the war. And my granddad wasn't a physically, you look at photos from when he was younger, he wasn't a physically strong man. But he escaped from two concentration camps. He was shot twice. Um, wow. And then he went on to, you know, there's a whole bunch of other stuff that we, you know, during that experience that he went through and he survived and he went on to have, you know, a, a, a wonderful family and and do good things in, in his community. He was sure. a strong man in that regard. Is that what we need to be talking more about? This this is what strength is. It's not whether you're physically strong. It's whether you're mentally strong, whether in the sense of you can stand up to fear. You are willing to stand up to fear. Yeah. I think that the, well, I don't want to lose sight of the physical strength component because I'm you not advocating. Healthy. For There's a difference. Yeah. 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 Huge, huge thing. I'm yeah. not advocating for everybody to be able to bench press 325 or squat 400 pounds. <laughs> that's not it. I, I don't even do that anymore, right? Like yeah. that's those. Uh, I'm. Uh, I believe in functional fitness, and as a father right now, like my my main goal is to keep up with my kids, be strong, be able to support my wife, do everything I need to do, and then if I need to protect my family, I will. Again, we have guns here, <laughs> um, <laughs> but <laughs> yeah. however, with that said, um, I I absolutely think you're onto it because the fear thing. Um, you know, when, when you, when you're not, when you, when you're afraid to speak up for what's right, when you're mm-hmm. afraid to do the right thing, when nobody's looking, um, it, it, that's, it's that, that's the exact opposite of being uh, a man and being emotionally intelligent, right? Like that's, that's a coward. You called it what it is. And if you're, um, you know, we, we have a core, um, it's something that we teach. It's like a core foundational principle of leadership is, is again, doing the right thing when nobody's looking, right? It's like the people at the grocery store who, don't take back their grocery cart, right? Like if you don't do that, 
I know for a fact you're cutting corners in other areas of, of your life yeah. and you are, <laughs> I'm, I, I hate to judge like this, but like you are a subpar human in my eyes. You are below yeah. where you should be as a stand as, as standards in life. As men, uh, our standards as a society in my country, at least have fallen drastically. Mm. And when your standards as a whole drop in society, again, going back to the, the saying we talked about weak men, we have a we have this the fattest and sickest nation in the world. We also are the most most resourceful nation in the world, and so there's a big disconnect there, right? Yeah. And so when you you know it doesn't make sense, but we have the we have the fattest, most sickest nation in the world, and our standards as a whole uh, have fallen tremendously. And so mm. when you have this trickle down effect of standards going from what they once were, right? Like we I've seen some pictures um, from like the 1970s of some of the beaches here. And they'll show like women in like whatever their bikini ish thing they were wearing then. And then like the men in their little short shorts or whatever, there's not a single obese man on the beach, right? They're all in at least decent shape. Hmm. And each year when my family goes to the beach, I always like, always like for two weeks, I'm like, all right, I'm going to cut out all alcohol. I'm going to go on like a, I'm going to get it. I'm I'm going (laughs) to cut. My abs are going to be popping for the beach. I get all excited about it. And then I get to the beach and I look around. And I'm the only guy that's fit, right? It's like, okay, I put in all this work to have my abs show a little bit more. And I got a bunch of soft, obese dudes around me who like can't even (laughs) hold a candle to what I got going on here, right? I'm, I'm a humble dude. I say that with, with all due respect, but that's the, the, the status of my, of my country. And so when we talk about the mental strength though, you talked about physical strength and mental strength and doing what's right and being able to stand up for what's right. Your physical fitness is simply an extension of your mental fortitude. Let's mm. be honest. If you if you are obese and you are unkept, you automatically show me that you don't have enough self-respect for yourself, right? Yeah. It is there is not a bigger sign of of self-respect than your physical fitness. Yeah. Well, in order to in order to be physically fit, you have to be mentally strong. Because mm-hmm. what does it take to be physically fit? It takes discipline. It takes mental fortitude. It takes yeah. being over being able to overcome adversity, whether it be small or big. Right? Mm-hmm. How do we? How can we become the rock for our family? Right? How can we become the glue that holds our family together in those tough times? Right? Death is coming for everyone. Right? We yeah. all deal with it. Um, illness is coming for everyone. We all deal with it at some point in our life. A family member, somebody. Mm-hmm. You're going to have catastrophic events in life. If you are not physically fit and mentally fit and you are soft and you fold into those scenarios, what kind of man are you and what kind of father are you being for your family, right? And so, again, I don't advocate for you to go out and lift 325, but if your standard is not to be strong, fit, and capable, then you're already behind the eight ball. And if you show me that you're physically unfit, I already know you got some major issues up here because you don't Mm. have the discipline. You might be an all-star at work. But if you can't make 20 minutes a day, a few times a week to take care of your body, and you, you can't make smart choices to fuel your body properly for what it needs to perform at a high level, then your standards as a man have fallen way below the line of the, the threshold line, right? We weren't put on this earth to be average or below average humans. I get that we need McDonald's workers. I'm not saying that. But should McDonald's workers also be obese? Shouldn't they at least have some kind of standard to take care of themselves? Because it's the only body we have, right? So mm. when you start talking about, when you start putting it in perspective like that, um, this stuff all goes together, right? Again, it's an extension of your mental fortitude, right? Your physical fitness. And so if you're not if, you, if, if you're not able to stand up for what's right in situations where you know you need to speak up, right now, over the last couple of years, we've had a lot of chaos. We've had a lot of craziness in the world. And the cowards have shown their true colors. There are people that have spoken out and stood up for what's right. And there are also people who have folded and say, you know what? I'm a, I'm a sheep. I'm not a lion. And I'm going to go ahead. I'm going to go along with the herd. Mm. I'm raising lions. My lions might grow up and become a janitor or they might become a manager at McDonald's. Right. But they're going to be the best damn janitor. And they're mm. going to know what health is. They're going to know what respect for other people is. They're going to know that we don't judge anybody by the color of their skin and we judge them by the character. Yeah. They're going to know what right and wrong is. And they're going to know that they need to do the right thing, even when nobody is looking. All right. And that starts with fathers at home 
showing their children the way, not telling them the way. Yeah, I love what you said about respect there as well, because having it's not just respect for other people, respect for yourself. And and when we're talking about physical health, yeah, exactly. You need to be looking after your physical health. That's part of it. Because if you, it's it's the same when you get on an aircraft. Well, what's that when they say you, you the gas mask drops down? Gas mask. <laughs> the mask. Yeah. The yeah. mask drops down. You put yours on first before helping yeah. someone else. Because if you can't help yourself, you can't help other people. And, and that's where physical fitness is important. And, and I, th- I think then and that's where I wanted to draw, I guess where I was drawing the line before was between that that macho Arnold Schwarzenegger type. You know, you, you don't have to be you know, physically no. well built, but you have to be well, take care of your health. I know people that are not, you know, that you would look at them and they're not physically strong, but they can run a marathon um, because, you know, that that's the fitness that they've worked on. And, and having that respect, as you mentioned before, that respect for yourself. Do we need to self respect? Yeah. 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 Do we need to have? Because I, I feel my personal thing is I feel we've lost. We've got a lot of what you can't do. Oh, don't do this and don't do that. And you mentioned about toxic masculinity and all oh, you know. And and people are going, what the hell? And to me, it was like I'm looking at going, what the hell can we do? And so I was looking at that, going, do we need to go back? And I was trying to work out where where is it the guidance as to what you can do. And so in doing that research, I actually did a bit of research and, and was looking at all the different areas of, of where that was. And one of the strongest ones I found was back in the Middle Ages when you had the Knight's Code. And the Knight's Code really set out, you know, this was a, what it was, was a higher set of principles that, and I look, I use the analogy from contracts. I deal with contracts a lot. And just said, just because a contract says you can, does that mean you should? And so what I did was I went and um, we, we rewrote the Knight's Code um, to be, in more modern so on the share.care website we've actually now got it posted the, the we call it just call it the code so it's it's gender neutral and it applies you, you, whichever way you, you write about it and it and it sets a higher set of principles of you know one of them is for example laugh at yourself and not take offense at others and it's in in that situation you go well just because someone's you know said something that might be insulting do i have to be insulted do i have to be controlled by that i, I use that from from my experience where you know people will say things usually to get a rise out of you i mean we do that with our friends you know we jibe them to you know as, right. as guys we jibe our friends to get a rise out of them if they don't rise to that, then the, the jibe doesn't work. And I, I use that with with insults, for example. If, if someone insulted me or said something that was insulting, I wouldn't react at all. It's like, so what? And I, again, i got to right. credit my mum with that. It's like, you know, don't care what other people say. It's you know, sticks and stones, that kind of thing. Um, and it's, do we need to be, you know, having this higher set of principles that we, 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 that we hold ourselves accountable to? Like you mentioned before, you know, I know when I go into a, a supermarket, if I pick up something and then I don't want that item, I will go back to where it, it you know, where it came from and put it back there because that's the right thing to do. Do we need yep. to be, have that? Yes, that's, uh, those are minimum standards. And this is something that we hammer on all the time because, Ultimately, like if we if you look at it, if you simplify this down to the the lowest level, um, you know, when you raise your standards as a person, you naturally will grow as a person. Right. Like in Mm. any area of life, when you raise your standards as a human being, you are going to get better in certain areas of life, wherever those standards are. You know, like Mm. my minimum standard for working out is three days a week. I will not allow myself to fall below that each week. If I do, it weighs heavily on my conscience, right? I, yeah. I I know that I'm better than that. And so what happens when you raise your standards as a man? Mm. That starts to have an impact on others that you yeah. are around, right? It has an impact on your employees or your coworkers. It has an impact on your family. It has mm. an impact on your community. If other people see you doing a little bit more, Human nature says they're going to want to do a little bit more too. Most yeah. cases, right? You still, you're always going to have your piece of crap people, right? Those, those are always going to exist. The lazy people that that have no purpose and they're just lost in life, and there, there's always going to be those. But generally speaking, when we raise our our standards as people, other people want to raise their standards. They say, see what's possible. They see that okay, well, like he's doing a little bit more. Maybe I should do a little bit more. My business yeah. partner always talks about how anywhere he goes, his goal is to leave it better than when he got there, right? Yeah. So if it's the grocery mm-hmm. store, take back an extra cart, hold the door for the for the old lady that's struggling, right? Yeah. I use this example a lot in my in my community uh, in the fatherhood and it's like if I'm if I take a shower 
and I, you know, put my deodorant on and I clean out my ears with my Q-tips and I go to throw the Q-tips in the trash can. Okay. And one of them misses. Yeah. I can very easily leave that Q-tip there for my housekeeper who comes every two weeks. Okay. Yeah. That's the easy way. Or I could do the right thing, pick up the Q-tip, throw it in the trash and tell my subconscious mind that my standards are above leaving yeah. it on the floor. It's the simplest piece of leadership that you can grasp. Like when guys want to, they're like, want to become better leaders and mm. they want to be, you know, have a, a, a you know, a, a, a more, more influence and all these things that all starts with those tiny little behaviors, because that is what tells your brain that you're better than that. You're, you're looking for an extra notch up, right? You're not yeah. allowing yourself to fall below the minimum standard. When we raise our minimum standards as a whole, like hmm. as a society, this is where change is created. And that's yeah. what that's why we place such a high, high emphasis on the standard piece. Because again, if it comes to your physical fitness, if you raise your standards as a person, hmm. naturally your physical fitness is going to be better. Correct. In your marriage, if you raise your standards as a man and a husband, and you're gonna and you know that you're gonna do a little bit more, like I have a checkbox hmm. in my head each day. I I go through faith. Fitness, family, and finance. Finance yeah. dominates my life because I'm always working on the business. That box always gets checked. Yeah. My faith always gets checked because my gratitude journal. And then when I go to bed at night, I, I pray. I write my, my, in my gratitude journal every day. The top two things that I always put is that I woke up for the day and God, right? Like those are, yeah. if I'm not grateful for those two things, I can't carry on with my life. Yeah. Family and fitness all depend, right? Fitness, mm. I work out four days a week. So if I don't, if it's not a day to work out, I got to check that box somewhere else. So maybe it's an active uh, walk with my family, or maybe it's um, making sure that I don't skip because sometimes, I, you know, sometimes I'll get a little lackadaisical and I'll skip like my greens powder or my turmeric, the things that I know that are going to, that are going to help my health, right? If it's not a workout day, I still got to check that box. But when it comes to the family, because I have these check boxes, the four F's, that family check box has to be checked somehow. Yeah. Generally speaking, that's going to be for my wife, right? For my marriage. And so what can I do to make my marriage a little bit better today? Well, mm. generally speaking, I can make sure all the dishes are put up and there's no dirty dishes in the sink so that when my wife comes home, she sees a clean sink because that's one of her pet peeves, right? Yeah. Or I can make I sure that. that the house is picked up, all the dog laundry and linen because the new yeah. puppy that I told you, it's all, it's all put up and like everything's neat and tidy, right? Yeah. For my kids, spending quality time with them and not yeah. being on the cell phone scrolling. That's a big a big focal point of mine is being present in the moment. Yeah. And so when you raise your standards, for me, checking those boxes mm. and looking for ways to even get a little bit better and a little bit better, that's how we grow as men. That's how we grow as people. And yeah. so I, I truly believe uh, we raise our standards as men. We raise our standards as a society. Others start to raise their standards. And that's how that's how we improve. The situation that we're in right now in my country, as well as yours, right? Like this is a worldwide uh, scenario here because it, you know, uh, it's human nature to want to do more when you see somebody else doing good things uh, yeah. that they don't have to do. Yeah, exactly. And, and that whole conversation about doing, and, and I love what you said there, because you, you tapped into what is important for your wife, you know, the, the dishes yep. and, and you go, and th to me, that's a manly thing to do to go, hey, this is important for my wife. I'm going to care for her. That's what being a man is. And, and yep. you know, and what would it be when we're talking about, you know, expressing emotions, it's like, honey, I, I care for you. That That's an expression of emotion. No, it's not, yep. and it, you might not have to, you're not, you're not, don't necessarily have to say it, but you're expressing that emotion that, you know, hey, this is what I, I care about. Yeah. I want to um, touch on, because you, you mentioned, because you have faith as well. I grew up, um, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm mostly Polish. I mentioned before, you know, a combination of Polish, Russian and, and Ukraine, but mostly Polish. Both grandmothers were Polish. And um, so obviously we, we well, not obviously, but we we grew up, you know, Catholic because of, you know, Polish is a very Catholic country. And from you know, throughout my life, I've studied other religions and I've got to know uh, friends, that, you know, Muslims and, and, and studied those religions as well. Um, so I've got that broad background. But one thing that always perplexed me with you know, having grown up with the Bible and reading, you know, the Bible as a, as a kid was... Um, the Bible's not always a pretty book. It's it can be no. quite you know it talks about you know 
you know, clothing dripped in blood and stuff like that. So, so it was always there was that strong thing. But it, the, the part that confused me, and I spent a lot of time thinking about this um, until I got resolution on it, was the, the saying that says the meek shall inherit the earth. I was at odds with that going, I don't understand this. The Bible is all about, you know, standing up for being strong, um, doing the, doing those kind of things. And then you've got this saying that says the meek shall inherit the earth. What I didn't understand, um, and I think we lost it, was that the word meek has lost its translation, its original translation. Because, um, and, and for, there's a pastor that lives across the road, or former pastor, he's a friend of mine, lives across the road. And we, we, I was having that discussion with him as well. Um, but after I had that realization, because I was talking about how meek is not what it goes, he said, Yeah, exactly. Meek, that's not what it means. Meek comes from the a Greek word, which re, which means great power under control. And what it was at that time, what they were saying was um, when that was written, as he described it, was it wasn't a weak person that inherits the earth. It was a warrior that doesn't draw their sword unless absolutely necessary will inherit the earth, which is a completely different meaning. And I know there's a bit of talk about that in the media at the moment. I'm just wondering from your perspective, you know, when you think about that and being a man asking a question, if you're a warrior and you can go, hey, I've got this issue, I need to ask for help. Because that's what a warrior does. A warrior will seek advice when they need to. A, a good warrior will do that. A good warrior will be able to say, hey, I've got a problem. Um, how do I get help? Because they will go to a, a wiser warrior, <laughs> you know, a master, for, sure. for, for guidance. That, that was the process. Is that what we need to be Putting that out, then going, hey, the the you know, you you as a man, you are a warrior, and part of that warrior, if you are a true warrior, you will only draw your sword, using that as a metaphor, when absolutely necessary. Other than that, you will listen, you will be kind, you will be thoughtful, those kind of things. Is that is that the the conversation we need to be having? Yeah, I think that um, I think that that is, you know, we. When you look back historically like that, right? Like mm. when you look at, you know, when we, because you, you mentioned the Bible, I'll, I'll go there for a second. I am definitely not a, I'm not an organized religion guy, right? My my wife is Catholic and I, I've agreed to raise my, my son's Catholic and it's because it's very important to her. And um, I'm, you know, that atmosphere is, um, it's not exactly what I, what I need in my life when it comes to the spiritual side. Yeah. I have a personal relationship with my higher power and that's where that's all I need, right? I yeah. don't need the organized crap because I think that a lot of um nowadays especially a lot of these churches have gone really political. And <laughs> yeah, I'm well, that's not why I'm there. No, but and that's not the purpose. I, I I agree with what you're saying. You no, find in yourself all. whatever your higher power is and whatever it is and we have that with share.care, find your source of strength. That might be music. That mm -hmm. whatever you what it is gives you strength and some for some people as you said you have a higher power yeah not yeah. not yeah and so, away from the politics <laughs> <laughs> yeah and well when you talk about that man like when you when we really break it down um with the political thing um when it comes to church it's like when when i'm starting to see stories about you know like some of the evil people that we talked about before the before the show meeting with the pope and like he's encouraging part of the agenda Mm -hmm. Uh, I get red flags real quick on that. And I'm like, yeah. Nope, I'm out. I'm checked out because that's not why I'm here. Uh, yeah. This is not good. That's evil. And I need good with my higher power. And so for me and, and my wife's even starting to get some red flags around it too, but, um, that's a separate conversation. So going back yeah. to your question, I think when you look at historically speaking, like, I'm not going to tell you that every word in the Bible that I believe every word in the Bible, it's just not, um, you know, the, the whole Bible study thing. Like if, if I am supposed to have faith and like, that, you know, if I'm considering yeah. myself a Christian, I'm supposed to have faith. Um, am I going to have faith that that book has not been rewritten and retranscribed probably thousands of times since it was <laughs> originally written? Like, who am I to believe that, you know, the, the, these the, that all this is word for word, mm. right? So yeah. I think the Bible has some great concepts. There's great lessons to be learned. But I'm not going to sit here and tell you that I believe that every word of that is true, right? Like, I, I got my own thing going, and I, yeah. I, I feel like I have a healthy relationship with God. Um, but it's my God, right? It's my higher, higher power. It's yeah. what I believe and what you believe is up to you. I come from a world where I used to be an atheist. I used to yeah. not believe. I was very anti-God mm. uh, and anti-religion. And I think a lot of it was fear-based. And I think yeah. a lot of it uh, was pain that I was carrying around 
uh, as from from my my checkered childhood past. Um, yeah. But I think when you look at it historically speaking, and you look at how men, um, really how we've evolved as men, uh, we're not meant to be soft and weak with man boobs and a beer gut, man. Like if you think that, <laughs> yeah, men, that that's the point. Like, where, put religion aside because whatever you believe in. Yeah. And so I have friends who you think? You know, different and and the, the different religions. What what I'm getting at is is do we need to be having hey, you need to be a strong man, and a strong man is you know. Is what you know. You are a strong man. You are you. You can face your fear, as we talked about before. You can be that warrior if you need to be, but you don't. You know that's not what you project. Yeah. I believe that every man has that inherent trait somewhere in him. But when you yeah. start to strip testosterone away yeah. and you start to put on weight, which is you know body fat is very estrogen friendly, um, you start yeah. to lose start to yeah. lose some of those. Um, some of those traits, right? Some of that goes away. And so when you yeah. look back at, let's let's go back hundreds of years and we talk about like the caveman days, right? Mm. Or even, even past that, like let's look at the 1900s where like when I brought up the Great Depression, yeah. uh, you know, the tough times create strong men thing. Like those men that lived during the Great Depression um, or when you go back to when we were, when we were doing civil war stuff in the, in the United States, right? Those guys... We're like savages, right? Hmm. And if you weren't, you didn't have to be a savage to survive then, but you had to be able to at least hold your own, right? Yeah. Our standards from now compared to then are like a 180. And in hmm. order to function in a society where, you know, we're all inclusive, we're, we're preaching inclusivity and that uh, the body positivity and like uh, health at every size, like you and I both know that 300 pounds uh, five foot five and 300 pounds is not healthy. And yeah. putting that on a magazine cover and telling me that that can be healthy um, is disgusting, right? Mm. And so the, the fact that we've got society telling us these things, and then men are led to believe that, well, maybe that's okay. Maybe I should let my guard down a little bit. Maybe I, sh I can drop my standards a little bit. Because at the end of the day, the human body wants to be comfortable, right? It's yeah. homeostasis. We yeah. don't want to be freezing cold. We don't want to be in pain. We don't want to have to go through adversity. Men have to choose adversity now, right? Like you got to choose to go work out. You're putting yourself in some pain. You got to choose to eat the food that's not going to make you have all the dopamine and sugar rush afterwards, that it's actually healthy and is going to fuel your body. You yeah. got to choose the hard things when you don't want to choose the hard things in mm. order to grow as a man. And the yeah. only way that we're going to get anywhere as a society is showing men that number one, some of the strongest, most physically fit, most masculine men in the world have asked for help many times over. Look at some of your highest performing athletes. Yeah. Look at some of your highest performing business elites. Look yeah. at some of the highest performing men in the world. They've all asked for help. So yeah. why isn't it okay for the average Joe that's just trying to get better in life, just wants to be a little healthier, a little stronger, a little bit better. Why is it okay for him not to ask for help? Why is he conditioned to believe that he can't ask for help, but like the most powerful men in the world have all asked for help probably yeah. hundreds of times in their lives. Yeah, that's the point that I was getting to. Then that's part of that yeah. that worry attitude is like you mm -hmm. you ask for it because all the strong men, and I was in the SAS and dealt with the, the police, TRG. Um, we work with those guys as well. And yeah. these are really tough guys and they all asked for help. They all were yeah. okay expressing yeah. their emotion. They had no problem. If they were having an issue with something, I mean, they didn't just, get online and well back then we didn't have online but um that's how old i am <laughs> but we didn't yeah they, they didn't sit there and complain and, and whinge and moan but they went they went to a, a appropriate source and said hey i need help i've got an issue here they went to someone that was you know the master so to speak and said hey i need help and and i think to me i, I mean it seems to be we, we all will I mean, what, what, what would you be, you know, how do you, you get guys to, to realize that and say, hey, is it just, let's have more of these conversations and go, this is, this is what strength is. Strength is facing your fear. That's what being, being tough is. That's what being strong is. That's what being macho is, is facing your fear and saying, hey, I need help. Yeah. I think, uh, you know, to, to bring it full circle, man, it's like, you've got to, you've got to set the ego aside, right? You've got to realize yeah. that if you want to yeah. get better in life, Mm. Uh, you need community, you yeah. need support, yeah. you need people that know a little bit more than you and the topic that you're trying to grow in, right? Yeah. I think that, you know, you know, generally speaking, we you you got you yeah. got your your health, your physical health, your physical fitness, 
you've got your, your marriage and your relationships, and then you've got your finances, right? Like those are kind of the three categories that, um, that life really kind of revolves around. If we're being honest, like if you tried to simplify life as, as much as possible, because without the physical health, you and you and I both know, like, you know, a, a, a healthy man wants many things and a sick yeah. man only wants one thing. Right. Yeah. And so you got to get past that. That's the foundation. Yeah. So if you're physically fit and you want to grow in any other area, finances, marriage, relationships, community, like you have to have mm. other people to learn from and other shoulders to lean on. And that's just the reality of it. Because if you're isolated, you internalize all your feelings, you isolate yourself and you're not asking for help. How do you expect to grow? If you don't have the knowledge, you got to go out and seek it. And it's possible to do it on your own. Mm. But man, the power of doing it with other people that are going through a similar journey as you, especially when it comes to men and going back to the community component, uh, I wouldn't be here with you today if I didn't have a community of people that were expecting me to show up to the spin classes that I took for a year to lose my 60 pounds. Like Those people were, were almost like, counting on me to show up, or at least in my mind, they're like, they need me there. Like I'm, I'm an important part of the class, right? Because I bought in. So did they, and that's just a, that's a very, uh, a a very minor level, but with physical health, like that's why a lot of our guys do so well is because holy shit, I'm in here with, with other fat guys that are all looking to grow and not just their physical health, but with their marriage, their finances. And like, I found a home. This is awesome. It's contagious, right? When you don't have that, and you lack that sense of community. You lack that sense of um, that that emotional, um, uh, I, I guess, relation with, uh, uh, with with other men, right? Like you you don't have anybody to share the trauma with. You don't have anybody to share the tough times with, uh, mm. because the tough times are few and far between. It might you know when it rains, it pours kind of kind of scenario, but like they're going to come. And if you're yeah. not prepared for that. Generally speaking, if you're a soft, weak man, you're going to fold and it's going to be very hard for you to find your way out of that hole. But if you're preparing yourself and you're getting more comfortable with being uncomfortable, asking for help, going yeah. to the gym when you don't want to go to the gym, eating that you know, salad when you want to eat the burger instead for lunch uh, on a Tuesday afternoon because you forgot to bring your lunch. Like Those are the decisions that add up to the big picture here. And if you're choosing to take the, you're always trying to take the easy road or the shortcut uh, and you don't ask for help, and you don't have a sense of community, and you're just going to go at it alone. Uh, it's it's going to be a tough life for most people in that situation. Yeah, I love that. I love that. And then, as you say, summing it up, you really need to face that ego, face your fear. Mm-hmm. That's what being yeah. being a man is, because that that's what you know. Really, what's stopping you from asking help is that fear, um, ego, and fear. It's yeah, your lack that. of emotional intelligence. You don't know how to handle your emotions. Your emotions control you instead of you controlling your emotions, right? Yeah. Your 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 mind is a tool. Your subconscious mind can either be used for you or can be used against you. And if you're not doing the things you need to do on a daily basis, then you're not going to go very far. We tell our guys all the time, it's like, hey man, you know, I, I made a post about this the other day. It's like, you know, if you're depressed right now or you 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 have a lot of mental health issues. Yeah. And this is you. Listen up, right? If you're not working out, you're not mm. managing your stress. You're not getting mm. quality sleep. You're not putting the things that you need to put into your brain. You're not out seeking knowledge. You're not reading good books. Yeah. You're not investing in yourself, not necessarily at a high level, but like you're not investing time into the things that you know you need to invest time in. If you're you're, you're avoiding porn, you're not working on your marriage. All of these things that are hard to do, but they're also easy to do, like on a day-to-day they're basis, if you're avoiding they're, they're those things. They're easy to do if you just just do it. <laughs> if you just do it. But yeah. here's the thing. When you start not doing all of that and you gain 20 pounds, 40 pounds, 80 pounds, you got all the stress, all this anxiety, depression. Aren't you choosing the depression? Aren't you choosing the mental health issues because you're choosing not to do the things you know are going to serve you at a high level? Yeah, exactly. One would say, right? And so part of being a macho man, or <laughs> we don't even call that, part of being a man is taking full responsibility for your yep. actions and your inactions yeah. every single day of your life. And when you start to do that, you start to simplify your life like that. Say, you know what? It's about extreme ownership, like Jocko mm. Willing, right? You take extreme ownership of everything in your life and your life will get easier. I guarantee yeah. you that because when you play the blame game, uh, you're not. it's a dead end road, right? Yeah. I own it. If I don't do it or I do it, it's me. I made the mistake or I crushed it. And I'm going to move on and I'm going to do it again. And I'm going to keep failing forward, but I'm going to lean into those that I know who can help me most. 
I love that. You, and, and that's the thing. If you, as a man, own it. Ask for help because you, you have to own that. Uh, I love. Oh that. yeah, hundred percent. We've we've we've. I've got I've got to run. I've got another thing coming. It's up, all so. good. We went for a while. <laughs> yeah, it was good. It was fun. It was yeah. really good. I mean, but I think that that point you said about owning it, you as a man, you need to own it. But I'd also like to for the listeners too, if for, for a place where you can own it, reach out to Jason. We'll put these details in the in the show notes. Um, you know, the fatherhood. He's got, you know, there's plenty of guys there that you can connect with. You can then you you can be in a safe place where you can actually, you know, talk about you know, what's going on. You can ask for help and, and they'll guide you in the right way. I, I'm pretty sure you'll accept any, any guy that's willing to to look for help. And if you need help, look, we got, we have offers from $10 all the way up. Like it, it, we have made it as easy as possible to get into our world. Um, we also have a free, a free 60 day program. Like if you go do the free 60 day program, it works on things that we've talked about in the show, not just the, not just the health component, but also building confidence, doing the things, doing the hard things um, that you got to do on a daily basis. It's a very sustainable program, um, but it's free. And we've had guys come out of there. We have something that we call the GBR method. It's gratitude, breathing, and reading. It's a little bit of a, a, a 10 minute morning routine. If you do that and you do that repetitively for 60 days, your perspective on life will drastically change. But if you're looking to get involved in the community, we have a community as, as cheap as 10 bucks a month that gets you access to our fitness app and a private group with other dads that are going or other men in general that are just all going through a similar journey but it's a safe space. It's a place to be vulnerable. It's a, it's a place to lean in when you need help, man. So yeah, any resources that you need for me, I'm, I'm happy to provide for you because our number one goal is, is just to give guys an outlet, give guys a source uh, and a starting place to, to get better. Yeah, exactly. And I love what you're doing, Jason. It's such a helpful um, environment for guys to be able to connect with each other and, and be able to open up and be able to, to ask for help and to express your emotions, So, which is which is a great place. All right, we got to. I got to. I got to run. But thank you again. It's been been really awesome, Jason. Yeah, man, this was fun, dude. I appreciate you having me on again. Yeah, it was awesome. Thank you for being part of the Share Care community and helping people around the world prosper. You're creating a bigger pie for everyone to share. The more people contributing to the world being a better place, the better the world becomes for others and for you.